Looks like they're very happy. Well, good morning, everyone. Every time I think of Devon Park, there's a blessedness that comes into my heart. Over the years, I've come here on and off. I remember teaching adult Sunday school here. And over the years, Pastor Terry Woodcock and I've been friends and we have shared many times together in prayer. So with great joy that I come to the pulpit this morning to preach the word of God. As you can see from your bulletin, the sermon title is Fusing the Great Commandments with the Great Commission. What does that mean? Based on Matthew 22, 34 to 40, 28, 16 to 20. After 41 years, I retired last October. 41. My latest church was an interim ministry in Sheffield Baptist Church in Halifax and five churches in the Maritimes before that. And I tell you, I could have never served anywhere more blessed and more inspirational than being a pastor for those years. So I bring greetings from Jenny and myself and Far Corners Ministry Board. The context of the Great Commandments was in the Passion Week before Jesus was crucified. The Sadducees had asked Jesus a question. It is a sort of nonsensical question. Why? Because the Sadducees, first of all, did not believe in the resurrection. They asked Jesus a question, and they authenticated by saying, Moses told us this, this. And that is, when a man dies, leaving his wife, his brother, marry her, and then if he dies, the other brother will marry. And the question, the nonsensical question is, whose wife will she be in the, of the seven in the resurrection? And they don't even believe in the resurrection. And yet they asked, by saying, using the preface, Moses told us that. What they were trying to do is to try and authenticate something that is not at all serious with a mocking question. And it's important to notice the way by which Jesus answered them. A mocking question. And in 22 chapter of Matthew, verse 29. You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people neither marry nor are given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven, but about the resurrection of the dead, have we not read that God said to you, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 6, where it says these words, and I'd like to read that for you. And it says, He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So Jesus quoted from the basis of Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, when he said what he said to those men. And it was at the burning bush and referred to Moses. What he did is he kept the answer that he gave to these men within the person of Moses. They said, Moses said so, and he used Moses when God spoke to him, 
spoke to him at the burning bush. What he did was silence them, silence them with the scriptures. Now, when you have religious leaders, men, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, they're supposedly the religious leaders and they know a lot. So when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they retaliated. They called from among them a man who is an expert of the law, in the law, from among them, to test Jesus with the question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You notice that playing with Jesus. The question seemed like an innocent question, normally in the courts of law. A lawyer asks an innocent type of question to try and trap the witness at a later and try to discount him and discredit him. You said that then, why are you saying this now? It's a strategy that is normally used in courts of law. Looks, sounds very innocent, but it is to create doubt. And what Jesus replied in verse chapter 24 was in 37, as we saw, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now what we see here, that he used the word of God to confront, to silence these men. Now where did he get that from? The scripture that I just read for you. If on the screen, if you can put Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5, if you can put that on the screen, and it says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So he quoted Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. And if I can read it for you from the screen. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of the people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. You notice he quoted scripture from the Old Testament to refute these men from the word of God. He used these references from the law, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, thus leaving these men speechless. And this is how Jesus works. This is how he is done when you read the scriptures. He uses the word of God to silence men because the word of God is powerful than a two-edged sword. It is important that we realize that when we read the Bible, there's a lot of theology, there's a lot of doctrine, a lot of teachings. But I have to say this to you. As long as the word of God and the theology is not activated into what it was meant to do, it remains in the pages, often not alive. If we just read the word of God and not live out the word of God, it's useless. It remains word. But the word must become application. The word must become flesh, as the Bible says. The divine writings are there. And the purpose of the divine writings in the scriptures are to set people free. To liberate the, rather than to bind. What I mean by that is sometimes there are people who try to bind people by using the word of God making them feel guilty, making them feel unwanted. And if that's the case for that, instead of liberating a person, these are just words. For example, let's look at the Sabbath law. What does the Sabbath law mean? Normally when we mention Sabbath law, what comes to our mind is rest, is the day of rest. And also, there is no labor. That's what comes to our mind. The law 
of rest and no labor. But this law was observed on the last day of the week. That's a Saturday. This is the Old Testament word of God or theology. But what happened when Jesus came into this world? I like the word fulfillment. All that is written in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So the Sabbath law also was fulfilled. The word Sabbath or Sabbathos means completed, means finished, it's done with. And that's what Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. It's done. Let's look at the story of the Exodus story of Israel. Israel was set free, liberated from the cruelty of the Egyptians. The cruelty. We don't think of that much, do we? But I want you to look. I'm going to share the scriptures from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15, and it, and it says these words. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, that the Lord your God brought you out, that, that with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So in other words, it is important that the, the freedom that the people have gotten from Egyptians had to do with the Sabbath. It had to come to an end. In that story, they were set free from the cruelty of, of what happened under the Egyptians. God liberated an entire nation to travel through the wilderness to the Promised Land. And we all know that story very well. Promised Land, why to settle? to build a home there, to rest. And from where they had to settle in the promised land, they were supposed to use the law of Moses that they received at Mount Sinai as a witness to the neighboring countries. And so what we have is the Egyptians made the Israelites work hard, forced labor, seven days a week, and we can imagine that. They forced it upon the families, the grandparents, the parents, the children, even little children. The Egyptians made them work, and it's not impossible to believe that they made them work seven days a week, forced labor. So what we see in the liberation of the Sabbath, or so-called taking them to the promised land, is freeing them from something that is so cruel bondage with very little food, very little rest. And I imagine beaten mercilessly and even killed. So what we have is a Sabbath is not just a legality of rest and no labor, but Sabbath means more. It means a liberation from hardships and setting the people free, the families free, the slaves free, the servants free, the animals free. Animals were overworked in Egypt. And even the land, you heard of the term Sabbath for the land. I believe someone mentioned yesterday, or Jenny was mentioning, that there are farmers who give the seventh year, they don't till, they let it be just basically a Sabbath for the land. And it is believed for those who practice this that it yields better crop if you practice the law of the Sabbath for the land, if practiced. There is a scripture in, in um, Luke chapter 6, verse 6 to 11. I'd like to read this for you. And here it is. Chapter 6 and 6 to 11. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the 
teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on a Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and he said to the man, that shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he did so. And Jesus said, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, save life or to destroy it? And so he stretched out his hand and he was made whole. And they were furious about this. Can you see the meaning of Sabbath? It's not just a law. It's for the welfare and the benefit of people, of those who are oppressed. To set the creation of God in human beings and animals free to serve him. And that's what Sabbath means. So in other words, it's much more than just a law. It's for the benefit of the people. So that is explaining to us the greatest commandments. Love your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is extremely important that we understand that this expresses what God came to do in this world as we see it in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that is the great commandments, the two commandments, love for God, love for your neighbor. And then we have Matthew, and that was read, the well-known scripture, the great commission. As the Sabbath, Jesus' work was liberating to set us free from the bondage of sin. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. So in other words, all that sin can give you a wage is death. And that's a reality ever since Adam sinned. So the Great Commission is the work of Jesus liberating people who put their trust in him and spare the consequences of sin. The Bible says, in Adam, all die. But in Christ, all shall be made alive. The wages of sin is death. But in Christ, it's the gift of God of eternal life. We sing hymns about it, Rock of Ages, at the cross. When you look at those words, you could see the liberating message that's coming through. So Christ was crucified. He did not die of fatigue. It's very important that we understand this. If Jesus, if Jesus was to be tested, he would be the best athlete in the world. He was strong. You notice that they beat him up all night. They, they hurt him so bad, cruel, and put him on the cruel cross right from one night into the next day. Most men would have died, but Jesus didn't. If Jesus had died because of fatigue, crucifixion would have no effect on our salvation. If he had died of an old age, it would have no effect on our salvation. And it's very important for us to realize that it's not old age or fatigue or sickness, not a natural death, not a heart attack or kidney problems or cancer or whatever, but he was crucified on the cross by his choice. And he was strong. And on the cross when he was, he said, it is finished. It is sabotage. It's finished. It's done. So on the third day, he rose from the dead. In other words, grave did not hold him. He didn't stay in the grave. He went on. If there is no death, there is no resurrection. It's, it's, it's important that we believe that. If there is no death, there is no resurrection. And it's important that we believe this to be true. So Jesus died by his choice and he was not murdered or killed or he died of a natural death. And our faith comes in him as we put our trust in him. And on the third day, he resurrected. 
in the 11th chapter of Matthew. Let me read to you a couple of verses. Uh, where he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me should not perish. In other words, when we put our trust in him, we become a part of his resurrection. We will resurrect someday. That day has not yet come. It's in the future. And this is the gospel. This is the good news that Jesus commissioned in the Great Commission to his 11 disciples, and Paul joined them later on, to take it to the world with this good news. Go into all the world and preach and make disciples of every nation. I'm sure you have heard this before. Why did Jesus use the word nation rather than countries? The reason is the meaning of the word nation comes from the word ethnos or ethnicity. There are about 10,000 ethnic groups around the world, 10,000. And every nation had to be reached. And it is still being reached right now. Every ethnicity. In the place where we are in India, the Far Corners Ministry, there are at least 300 ethnic groups. Take it to the nations rather than countries. Because when you say countries, you think of Canada, United States, Ukraine, whatever. This great commission is still being carried out in July of 2024 until he comes back again. In the book of John, um, chapter 1, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. It is referring to the time of the first stage of his second coming, that he will take us there where he's prepared a place for us. And that is the blessed hope for us as Christians and the results of the Great Commission. Now, the thing that I want you to think about for a moment is what happens when we fuse the Great Commandment, love for God, love for each other, and the Great Commission. What happens? It creates an overwhelming synergy. What does synergy mean? When we put two together, the synergy means it's proportionally greater. When there is a one draft horse, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, you can raise your hand and answer me. I don't mind that. One draft horse will pull four tons of weight. Can you let me know what two draft horses will pull? Raise your hands. Yes. Anyone? Did you say eight? No? It'll pull 21 tons. Two horses. That's called synergy. So when you fuse the great commandments with the great commission, there's a synergy that is created that is far more greater than treating each of these sayings of Jesus individually. Every church Every person who believes in Jesus Christ can bring these two realities together in the level they find themselves. Every church, every individual. It'll take too long for me to explain everything, but I'll give you what, what we did in 2007 when God called me to go to Northeast India one early morning. And I did not question him. I just went, just obeyed him. Why the place in Northeast India where I don't belong, I'm not familiar with the people. I come from a place called Mumbai. Now, this is way up north in among five different countries. Why did God send me there? I don't know, but I obeyed. But what happens is, I often tell this to people, and to young people particularly, if you hear a call of God to obey some, something, obey it. If you don't obey that, then he'll never show you the second or the third. 
And you begin to wonder, how come God never called me the second time? Because he never obeyed the first time. So what we did is we obeyed and went to that part of the world and took a team of 10 from Halifax. And then God showed us the second and the third and the fourth. It has been 15 years since Farconas ministry began with 22 missions. The latest one being in 23 February of last year. And as Jenny showed you, the first Baptist convention, 460 people, would have not been possible had we disobeyed. He would have never taken us there. The Harvest Fellowship is what we saw, 460 people. The, the 12 Baptist churches that were formed would have never been formed had we not obeyed. He'll never show you the second and the third if you don't obey the first. So in some small way, the reason I say small is Far Corners ministry is not huge. There's no big money. Whatever we have, I just want to let you know, one of the features of Far Corners ministry is financial accountability. In other words, what you give is what you saw on the screen. In other words, we have to be accountable with God's money. And anybody who misuses God's money, he will hold us responsible. He'll hold me responsible. For me, it is very important that we have financial accountability. So in some small or big way, when we fuse the great commandment, the great commission, something dynamic happens and something accountable happens. Each of us, Every one of us, Christians, churches, can be a part of that fusion. And as I notice in the uh, church uh, bulletin boards, you've got so many missions you support. And you don't realize how pleased God is with Devon Park. You're obeying the Great Commission with the love of God and the love for neighbor. And I want to ex encourage you by saying, keep doing it. Never feel that you have done something too much. All those places that you reach around the world is because you put the love of God, love for your neighbor with a great commission. And I want to encourage you. And this is why even for me to stand here in the podium, I feel a sense of empowerment because of a church that believes in these two. Anybody can be a part of the fusion, individuals or churches. And so in this partnership with the world, with the missions, you reach the world with the, great, with the Great Commission. So I want to, in closing, thank you for inviting Jenny and myself here this morning and sharing what we do. May we obey his, the eternal words of Christ in these two great commandments. And I want to say a very big thank you the word for thank you in the Hindi language is danyawad. Steve Hills often says that when he comes with me to India. Danyawad. That means thank you very much. May God bless all of you.